Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope you're doing well. Um, my week was certainly edified by having a chance to read this book. So this is Poems, Protest, and a Dream. It's a collection of works by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, <clears throat> and it is outstanding. I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. Um, and I recommend all aspects of it. So it's, it's a collection of works. Uh, Sor Juana uh, lived in what we now know of as Mexico, but she was living in the latter half of the 17th century. So this is about 120 to 150 years before Mexico declares its independence from Spain. Um, so she, she uh, lived her entire life there, was born in Mexico to a Spanish family, though. And so that, that tension exists in sort of how she perceives, you know, the, the indigenous uh, the indigenous natives there in, in Mexico. But it, it's, she's a fascinating writer, a very, very sharp mind, uh, deeply ironic, but incredibly well, well read and incredibly well learned. And it's just a delight to, to read and sort of engage with, you know, as a, as a, as a fellow mind. Um, just astonishing work. So the, the, uh, the book is called Poems, Protest, and a Dream. I think culturally she has the most relevance still as, as a poet um, in Mexico. And she, she's a fantastic poet. She writes a number of sonnets. Uh, this book has a number of sonnets. It has a number of more like ballad style, uh, lyric, lyrical ballads. Um, it has some that are more written almost in the form of like a, what the medieval romance poem had become under the Spanish golden age of literature and you know, sort of after the Renaissance. There's even a, a play, <laughs> this weird like almost courtly mask. Um, and then a dream is El, Sue uh, El Sueño, uh, I dream or first I dream and it's that is this close to a thousand line poem that is just stunning uh, but I want to talk about protest first because <laughs> that's the one that I can't wait to read with my daughters when they're a little bit older and so the the actual title is I want to because the title itself is just ironic response to the most illustrious poetess Sor Filotea de la Cruz and that's written to a man <laughs> who she repeatedly addresses as my most illustrious senora, dear lady, it has not been my well, my will, my poor health, or my justifiable apprehension that for so many days delayed my response. And, and, on, um, and repeatedly refers to this male figure within the church as, you know, sister or my lady. And with deep intention, because she, this, this, this authority figure had, this male authority figure had written a letter, like it's sort of an open letter to Sor Juana saying like, you know, you need to stop, as a woman, saying you need to stop this secular learning, you need to stop writing the poetry, you need to stop all these things, like you don't have the standing to do this, you know, Your, our, our place as women is, I mean, it's just nonsensical. So she just responds and, and continually <laughs> refers to him as my sister, my lady, and it's the, the <laughs> every time you just feel this little dagger sliding in. But she's brilliant. Um, she, she has a number of, of just absolutely beautiful uh, sentences within there. One is, um, there seemed to me no cause for a head to be adorned with hair and naked of learning, which was the more desired embellishment. Um, later on, the argument of the logician moves in the manner of a straight line along the shortest route, while that of the rhetorician moves as a curve by the longest, but that both finally arrive at the same point. And she employs both forms of that, of that argument. She has moments where she's very declarative and you sense this almost like white hot passion. Like she knows she's right as she's saying, as a woman, not despite being a woman, but as a woman, I need to know all these things. It's actually good for my faith to know all of this. But there are also times where she just marshals these arguments like a panoply and swings around and just crushes. And she, she has this bit where she catalogs different types of learning, geometry, arithmetic, um, you know, uh, uh, logic. She just goes through all of these different ones. And then she provides b biblical examples about why she needs to know it. She needs to know geometry to understand um, the temple, you know, the tabernacle measurements. She needs to know architecture so she can understand the descriptions in Kings of Solomon's temple. And she just goes through like the, all of these secular learning components actually strengthen my faith. And not only do I need to know this, but all the women I'm working with in this convent need to know this. And she's brilliant um, and, and just an absolutely thorough and, and such a carefully elucidated argument on why it was so important in the 17th century for a woman to have, to be able to learn and to be able to read. And she talks about like, I was doing this as a kid and it was so important. She even makes this hysterical bit where she kind of ribs on Aristotle and says, you know, I've read Aristotle and I think he, 
it, it would have helped him a little bit more if he'd had to learn how to cook because he would have been able to write with his great mind about other things too. <laughs> I mean, the beauty of a woman in New Spain or Mexico in the 17th century writing about how she's got one up on Aristotle because she knows how to cook is fantastic. Um, so I want to talk now a little bit about El Sueño or a dream. So that's about it. It's close to a thousand lines. And the closest that, that it resembles, it resembles um, aspects of the type of writing Alexander Pope was interested in, uh, where, where there's just this brilliance behind all of it. But there's also this really close reading of the classics. So there are references to Ovid, to St. Augustine, um, to, to other classical works just abound. And, and she's very thorough, but very, um, she's also very concise. And there's also this aspect to the dream as it's, it's almost her take on what we see in sort of the, um, the like you're gonna, you're gonna have a dream and, and, and engage in this journey of learning, so, somewhat like Dante does. Except she does this alone, she doesn't have a companion. Um, and I, I think there's this aspect of she was having to do all of this learning and reading alone on her own in, in life, and so she doesn't have a companion, she doesn't have a Virgil to guide her on this dream. But I wanna read the first, uh, you know, series of lines from him because it shows just what a what a beautiful and strange voice she possesses. Pyramidal, doleful, mournful shadow, born of the earth, the haughty culmination of vain obelisks thrust toward the heavens, attempting to ascend and touch the stars, whose resplendent glow, unobscured, eternal scintillation, mocked from afar, the tenebrous war, blackly intimated in the vapors of the awesome, fleeting adumbration. This glowering shadow touched the edge, but did not wholly absorb the goddess's orb. Three, Diana's faces that show her beauteous being in three phases, being but conquered only air, misted the atmosphere, that darkened densely with each exhalation, and in the quietude of this silent kingdom, only muted voices could be heard from nocturnal birds, so solemn and subdued, the muffled sound did not disturb the silence. And it goes on, and it is just incredible like the imagery is there the the references are there the illusions are there the 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 just this incredible way of looking at the world and looking at our place in the world as a single human fantastic but she also then produces these really interesting little sonnets and, and poems and so i want to read just two of those uh lisi into your hands divine i give two chestnuts with thorny spines because where roses bloom in number Thorns will flowers, stems, and cumber. If to their spines you are inclined, and so contrive to trick your taste, forgive the shocking lack of grace of when one who sent you such a toy. For if you would the meats enjoy, then first you must the burr embrace. I liked that one. And then uh, this one. This, this again, this dovetails well with El Sueño. O malady of hope, your persistence sustains the passing of my weary years. While measuring my wishes and my fears, your balances maintain equivalence, deceitfully, and with what indolence. The pan begins to tip, but as change nears, invariably your parity adheres. Despair is counterpoised by confidence. Still, murderous is how you must be known, for murderous you are when it is owned. How between a fate of happiness or strife, my soul has hung suspended far too long. You do not act thus to, pro to prolong my life but rather that in life death be prolonged. And, I mean, I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> Sor Juana is a mind that we should all uh, just be thankful that, you know, she, she existed and she wrote these works and that they survived and we get to, you know, uh, have our minds interrogated by her today. Um, she was an incredible influence on the brilliant poet Octavio Paz, uh, who even wrote a biography of her. As I mentioned, she, her works abound with references to Aristotle, including the fact that he didn't know how to cook and that affected his, you know, the, that deprived him of some knowledge that he would have probably enjoyed. And St. Augustine, um, probably one of the finer readers of, of both that I've encountered. And as I mentioned, her poetry reminded me somewhat of Alexander Pope, except a little more passionate. And she's just filled with, with references to, in the 17th century, this woman, and this is in her in the Spanish translation, is making references to Adams. <laughs> like she's read Lucretius and Democritus and stuff. It's fantastic. Um, uh, so Ovid is referenced many times, but also uh, a number of other Roman works. So I highly recommend Sor Juana, and I hope you have a good weekend. Thanks.